Hello, everybody. Uh, my talk today is about the Richard Bright Paper Conservation Project. The whole project was carried out over the course of seven years, which include the initial uh, planning stage and three separate external grant um, applications and the fundraising and also appointing a conservator and the actual treatment, conservation treatment and digitization as well. I'm going to talk about how the condition of the collection was like, why it needed to be done, and what we actually did, and then also the result of the project. Sorry, just one technical issue, just to be just bad. <laughs> okay, there we go. I think we're just going to have to use that there. Okay. Sorry, All right? Apologies. Okay, back onto the next slide. Um, okay, right. So prior to the project from 1983 to September 2014, we didn't know very much about the collection. Two boxes containing the unknown number of recorded letters, notebooks and sketchbooks, not individually catalogued, believed to be the early 19th century materials, and an identified correspondent and then addresses, and remained untouched and inaccessible since the accession. <laughs> the reason for the prior to the project, the reason of that, all of the unknown factors came as a result of the poor condition of the items. As you can see on the pictures, these are examples of the notebooks. Um, you can see that um, you can inter insect damage to the pages and also binding began powdery and delaminated. Those sort of conditions are similar to the letters as well. You, you can see this. Um, some of the paper was so reduced to a powder and a fused together. As you may see, the extent of damage was too severe to handle without causing further damage. So any movement of the boxes, we got two boxes initially, run the risk, risk of the loss of more information. The kind of work, this is a kind of work that, that you open a box and then you want to put the lid back on straight back on, <laughs> pretending that you haven't seen it. That sort of condition. However, we are at the time, um, we have been long stuck in a sort of catch-22 situation where the item is too damaged to be handled. That was why we didn't know the condition, condition I didn't know the con contents, but because of that, we can address the invariable source of variableness of the resource. But because of that, it was incredibly hard to justify its importance to the to apply the, the, any external funding. <laughs> So that was how a scoping study started. The study took place for three months from September 2014. It was carried out, carried out by me. <laughs> this was the study was to determine the extent of work required to make the paper accessible. What I done <laughs> was to compelling comprehensive condition of report including the investigation of the types of ink and paper. Categorizing all the items according to the six condition levels, level one to level six, one being least damage and the six being most damage. And establishing a suitable condition procedure appropriate to each group. And estimating the treatment time and costing time for the project. Yeah. 
So I want to show you that what the kind of you know, level that I'm talking about. So you can see the level one. It, it's it's almost you can see you can use as it is, but there's some this bit of tears and and the degraded part, but not damaged not too much. But as as the level progressed to level six, you can see that that substrate, the paper substrate, is deteriorating so much. So in terms of ratio percentage, the percentage of the item in each condition and loose letters. So mostly um, level three and level four, and then some of them are, it's only 2% is a level six. Then that point, we estimated the number of items is a loose letter was eight, in fact to 849 and <laughs> certain notebooks pages um, containing 834 pages. So total this number of, of items are in two boxes. I still estimate this time because of that when I was doing a, the scope of study and then there's some papers are fused together and that until the point of treatment, you didn't quite know exactly that is just one letter or actually two letters fused together. Sometimes you just get the paper folding into just a tiny piece inside or something like that. That you didn't really know the point of scoping study. So that was still estimate, but just we just got the rough idea of the whole number involving in the two boxes. So, so during the scoping study, I developed the treatment methods and trial to work out common treatment procedure for items and the rated condition level one and level five. So things like some treatment items are in level one, you can wash in this way in a tray and immerse into water. But some of them that's degraded so much, you can't use the same technique. So which one can be used for, for this technique? Which one can be done for this? That sort of thing. And also the many options that I had to consider. So um, this is to assess the treatment times um, and of items in each condition level. So um, you can see that the table on the right hand side that summarizes that the level, <laughs> each level, level one to level five, and which treatment can be done, and washing and cleaning, and then you know, lining that this can be done, this is not done, and how long it's going to take. And at the, the bottom of the table, it shows that each treatment time per seat is say. So level one or on the top, you can't quite see at 1.5 hours. But on the other hand, at the end, level five, 7.3 hours per seat. Mm -hmm. Then that point, then I have to give up the idea of treating the, the ones in level six because that's completely in dust. Mm -hmm. it's, it's untreatable. So you have to really accept that this is not going to happen. And also level five as well, things like this on, on the picture on the screen, this is in level five. It takes seven, average 7.3 hours to conserve or handle, handle so to the stage. But you can't extract the information much because of the sub paper substitute that degraded so much, although the information has been lost so much. So it's very hard to justify to spend eight hours, so for example then you can't get the information very much from it. So the idea is to, although you can conserve, but again, is to give up the idea of it to compromise. Focusing on level one to level four, and then study reveal that the total duration of treatment is about three years, three and 1.6 um, years. Then adding up to all kinds of necessary work, photography, condition report, cleaning up, making a paper, repair papers, all necessary relevant works to be added to, and then about 4.48 years to take. And at the level of skill required is a very highly skilled person needed. So, So here, that uh, phase one conservation project started from 2017 to 2019. So the scoping study was 2014, but that three years that we have to apply 
funding and, and all sorts of things and preparation and recruiting conservator and, and, and appointing conservator and also have a time off and all that. Then 2017 being the um, the actual conservation phase has started. So this is a David Barker. So we managed to appoint this conservator as a project conservator. Just to remind the aim of the project is to, to allow this resource to be fully accessible to the researchers via high resolution digital image in conjunction with extensive catalog. The tasks are treatment of the first two boxes, we call box eight, we call box seven and eight. Eight contains a bit. So in terms of condition level, it's more easy, I mean, better than condition seven. So we started off with the easier one, although it contained a lot of damaged one as well, but we started eight and containing 403 letters and six notebooks and a sketchbook with 395 pages. So can I ask you a question? I'm, I'm a little bit behind. Did you know that these belong to Richard Bright? And how did yes. you know? Well, when we... Because well, I, you started talking about the papers, but I didn't know whose papers they were or what was in the box or how you we, came to them. So can you just clarify that before you go on? Because it helps to understand what, we, what we didn't know. We got a question um, from the audience that, um, well, how we didn't, how we, how it is to just correct me, just how we knew that the essential information of if we belong to food and things like that. So we, when we accept but that's kind of thing that's a bit frank is I'm sure to, to cover um, after my talk. But um, and when we accessioned the collection, the collection in 1983, so obviously that collection was came from the, the Richard Bright's descendant. So we knew that the basic information of it, but we didn't know what sort of thing is involved, the who role did it let that to who and things like that. And also the, I should imagine that uh, the one we accession it just at the ramp up of the box and just contain lots of bundles of letters and all that in you know in one go. So uh, then condition was just so severely deteriorated. So so we got information about the Richard by related family papers. But not exactly what what it is, and also not the books of when that was written by Fu by Richard Wright. We knew about the when he wrote it or what it was about. Okay. So, but that was 1983, and then the, because of the condition, it's been untouched and known so long until Scoping City. <laughs> okay, um, the task the, the treatment of of this amount of um, items and digitization of the conserved items and reboxing of the collection. So my, um, my colleague David um, put together that how he did just from the beginning. So in terms of conservation treatment, so unfolding to start with, with and the physical stabilization of, um, of the paper, uh, some people are just so degraded, you can't do anything about before you're just stabilizing it. And condition reporting and photography to make sure that you took captured image of before condition, before treatment, what was like before you do anything. And washing other aqueous treatment and the repair, localized repair or facing, which is the lining for the whole thing. Um, numbering and the trimming edge of the repair. And once we've done that, then digitized and the catalogs. That's a source of flow of, of the um, treatment. So I'm gonna show you some of the um, picture, um, images of the condition treatment. So for example, starting off this sort of a folded letter to unfold very, very carefully on the suction table with you know, bone folder. Stabilizing it to just to make sure that which part will belong to which. You can hold like, unfold like this. 
it takes a while to get these sorts of things to get this this even voting. So you might appreciate how difficult it is to do you know because at one least you can make it um they made a you know facing paper um so temporary stabilizing at all the rules part before you do anything aqueous treatment once it's that the piece has been in one piece you can handle the one piece until then it's so difficult to do anything you can put on that um frame so this is actually silk frame and silk screen frame to do gently wash you can put water underneath so that so that all the degraded parts and substances coming out via the, the silk screen so that uh, unlike the paper is it in fact is immersed directly this is a very gentle way of treating degraded item take it out from it and then dry under tension and then making lining paper using the you know, two grams square meters Japanese paper and then facing on the both sides, you know, rectal and verso. So, um, 2020 to 2021, phase two conservation also started. Again, the aim is to complete the project conserving the remaining collection consisting of seven notebooks and 403 letters. This is to focusing on the other um, box, box seven. And then that whole work was supported by Welcome Trust and National Manuscript Conservation Trust and private supporters. We achieved conserved 225 loose letters, which is 46% of the whole uh, number of, of letters we have, and seven notebooks, and digitizing them and reboxing with archival quality box and paper. So the outcome of the project and the future of the correction. The outcome of the project, providing the safe access to the contents that by means of digital images of the items. But original items are still viewable and the conservator supervision. So if it needs to be seen, the original one needs to be seen and you can always contact us and so that we can supervise you to have a look at the original items. And the future of the correction, the remaining work. In fact, we didn't finish the whole thing. Completion of conservation for the treatment. So what we what left is 268 letters in box seven, the second box we done, which is 70% of the total numbers left that remain untouched. Well, we, we touched, but haven't finished yet. So that we want to finish. It is estimated that the remaining works will require 11 months. Cataloging, cataloging of the item item level. Every item will be cataloged item to item level in line with ISAG, which is International Standard of Archive Description. Authority records will be created and linked to the, the item level descriptions. These will cover personal names and places and subjects. Sharing the dis descriptive metadata and the digital image online. And more promoting the resources. So that's my end of my talk. So um, I'm going to pass talk to Frank. Thank you very much. Okay, so having seen the work that Yuki has done on this fascinating collection of piles of old dust, you may say, two things, once she has quite rightly told you that they are established being the papers of Richard Bright, you may say, one, who he, who is Richard Bright, some people will know, but probably more than I do, and also the other important question, what do we know about Richard Bright now, but we didn't know five years ago, whenever it was that Yuki started this project, so I'm going to try and talk about both those, um, various dates, so this is the context of which we're talking about, uh, the early years of the 19th century, pre-Victorian going on to early Victorian, 
He was a medical doctor, but he was also a man of many other talents and interests, as the letters and above all the journals show. He was uh, born in Bristol. His parents were, his father was a banker and a merchant, and I think important, a dissenter. So which is the, where we're coming from, wealthy dissenter merchants he's obviously a very intelligent bright lad and with a rich background um and he goes to university not at oxford or cambridge i think which i think was difficult if not impossible for dissenters at that sort of date but he goes to edinburgh where very much said stockton say in the summary form he's meant a land of dissent and he does a general science degree there which i suppose accounts partly for his many interests in many fields of science and then goes on to specialize in medicine and um he is obviously a bright lad because as soon as he's finished there or even before he's finished there in 1810 he gets a job at guy's hospital in london and he's there for the next ooh, 1810 to 1844 34 years rising from being a, whatever the most junior rank is of a student type doctor, all the way being to a, a teaching type doctor at, at the end of his period. Guy's was founded, I will look this up, 1725 by Thomas Guy, the reception of 400 persons, poor and incurable. So that's, that's where he's getting his first job there, as I say, and staying here for 44 years. Um, And this, just during this time, he writes his famous studies of medical cases, um, which he tends to specialise in kidney disease, nephrology, to use a posh term. Um, and if you are unfortunate enough to have a pain in your kidneys and go to your doctor, even now, he or she might, it would be rather old fashioned today, to be honest, but they might say, aha, you have got a Bright's disease, as he discovered it. Uh, an aspect of a disease of the kidneys and indeed if you go online you can look at his notebooks which have some extraordinary revolting colored images of swollen and kidneys and all sorts of odd things sticking out of them and things i've not given you any of those just being a, a light entertainment show so we bear in mind that he that's, that's, that's what he's famous for he's sometimes called the father of nephrology nephrology being kidneys but of course he did all, did all, all sorts of other medical work as well in this hospital guys and in 1844 when he leaves guys he takes up private practice from based on his own house which now has a plaque you see it is important there's a plaque to him in london he this is actually in savile row he moved into, into the posh house in savile row in 1831 when he was still at guys in 1844 he gave up at guys and went into private practice um in 18 sometime in that time he also became physician extraordinary to queen victoria so he's obviously a man of some importance i don't think that's is it by any means a unique position i mean i imagine she had many physicians ordinary and physicians extraordinary and paradoxically curious enough the physicians ordinary are more important trying to find this out through a trawl of wikipedia this morning as the physician's extraordinary or only part-time called in occasionally so physician's ordinary to do the actual work but of course he's died so he long before she dies so he he would have been a physician to her during her younger years when she was having all those children that's the sort of time rather than when she was dying as well as being a physician a doctor a medical man he was a great traveler he was a writer on matters like gene geology, botany, languages, linguistics. So he's very much what we call a polymath, a man with a wide range of interests. And this you do get in the journals and the letters that Yuki has been talking about. For example, the journals that I'm calling them are in effect records of travels that he made. And these, which before were just piles of dust, now opening up to us revealing, for example, that in 1810, while still a student at Edinburgh, he went on a trip to the Lake District. When I say trip, it's not so much, not a casual holiday like you would take now, an expedition to the Lake District. 
Um, bear in mind, he had to get there. He had to go to get, get on the coach from Edinburgh to Kendall, where an annoying man kept talking to him nonstop while he was trying to get some sleep. Some things don't change. And then, then he got on the bail coach to, I think, Keswick and so on. And, of course, no maps. He didn't just wander about. He had to hire guides. And his interests are very much geological. He finds a fossil on Skiddle, for example. He talks about his Skiddle fossil that he's found. It's interesting because this is more or less the same time as Mary Anning is doing her fossil findings in Dorset, very much contemporary. And he finds at least one fossil in Skiddle. He goes to this thing. Which I forgot the name of. Difficult. It's in uh, Borrowdale in Yorkshire, and it's called the Boulder Stone, naturally enough. Good name for it. And when he was going, places like this were just beginning to open up as tourist attractions. It was in 1789 that the owner of this thing, Joseph Pocklington, put the ladder, maybe not that ladder, that ladder, but put the original ladder on it. And had a woman at the bottom serving teas, and I was expecting, expecting a small contribution from anyone who said that his ladder. So Wright describes that, so we're coming in at the, at the beginning of a tourist age, and that's been captured in his journal. He describes going to Keswick, for example, and looking at a collection of antiquities there. He describes when he's at Keswick, going to look at the lead mines, which are the lead mines where pencils are made. Some people always make a joke of this, so they might like museum at Keswick being the museum of pencils for the implication that it must be very boring. In fact, I believe it's very interesting, especially if it does include the, the geology and the history of the mining and things and all that. But that's first mentioned in Wright. Thanks to these letters, we know that Wright went there and made intelligent scientific comments on them. His next one is even more of an exhibition. He goes to Iceland. This is having fours. If anyone knows that John Prevyson, I probably pronounced that completely wrongly. Well, I apologize. But anyway, he goes on and he mentions this place having fours. I should have said perhaps, but when he's in London, he joins what's called the Royal Society, which is a group of high powered scientific investigators. Their motto is Nullius in Verba, which their website translates loosely as take no one's word for it. I don't believe anybody else has said, go and find out for yourself. And that's what he does. So he goes to Iceland because he's in the Royal Society, and this again is in the, in the letters of, and journals, he meets Joseph Banks, the botanist who went with Thomas Cook, who now is now is not Thomas Cook, Captain Cook, went to Captain Cook, um, who's by and who went, he also meets Sir John Stanley, who's also done an exhibition expedition to Iceland before him. And then they go off and he keeps his journal. So this is what we've got here. One of those things UK has uncovered is a journal of his trip around Iceland, where he's very much concerned with the geology, talking about things like geysers and things. And also talk about the language. After much endeavour, he finds what he thinks is the only Icelandic language book in rhetoric, and probably buys it and studies the language. So he's interested in linguistics, and we should come back to that. His most famous tour, which is 1812 to 1814, is Hungary. And this one we knew something about because he wrote it up. This was his best selling book even better than diseases of a kidney. People for some reason preferred his journeys down the Danube. And so if so it's a book, but now we've got this also, we've got the journal also, so we can match the journal with what is said in the book. And also in, I, in uh, Hungary, he gets very involved in the linguistics, the languages of the Hungarian people, which he divides into Three, I think three different languages or his dialects probably. And uh, he writes a book about that as well. And in some of the letters, he employs his brother, Benjamin, to do the proofreading of this book on uh, Hungarian languages. It's very difficult to proofread books like that. But, and then in one of the letters, he proudly sells, says, this has now sold 140 copies. So again, this is probably not the best-selling books, but important and interesting. And, the journals describe his experiences in Hungary. One of the things he does is he meets up with his local doctor and goes on the tour around his patients with him. So he's taking an interest in, in the medical side of it. But he also talks about the agriculture, the farming, the roads, 
know all these things, some of, some of which may just be in the journal and not have got into the book. So a traveller says when travelling is difficult. I think he goes by horseback, he talks quite a lot about Hungary. Hungary is quite famous for its horses and then he goes and meets a chap called Graf von, von something or other, who is a man very fond of horses. And when he goes into his lounge, he notices besides all these books in Hungarian and English book about race horses. So he obviously he's educated Hungarians, take an interest in the English racing system scene and vice versa. His final journal, which final journal for which I have seen, is more of a grand tour journal and takes us to Italy. So he goes around Italy. This, of course, is something anyone who's done any archive research is very, very familiar with the great and the good engaging on the grand tour of Italy. Plus or minus other countries but above all Italy. In fact, my colleague Vicky did a talk about this since she last year over year before, which may still be available online. I'm not sure if it is or not. But anyway, she won't have done the journal of Richard Bright, I'm sure, because it won't then have been made available. But Richard Bright goes through Italy taking an intelligent interest. So when he goes to Siena, he talks about the blue grey rocks. He says he's a geologist, it's not just these are pretty rocks, these are blue grey, they're blue grey because they're made of blah 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 and so on. So takes a geological interest, takes a botanical interest, takes an interest in the arts. He goes to the Sistine Chapel, for example, uh in Rome. So he goes from basically Florence, Siena, Rome, I think is his trip. And he talks about the ceiling here, the painting is most singularly beautiful. But he didn't like the Last Judgment. Which is, well, you know, it's just in trouble, you know, but the ceiling is, is indeed very beautiful. The Last Judgment is this big scene on the wall. He says it's the most disagreeable painting, possessing no attraction. It's maybe because as a dissenter, he wasn't interested in ideas of going to hell. Obviously, Last Judgment like this, maybe not appeal to his religious beliefs it may not have been that it may also have been you got to remember was when you look at this if you look at this at pictures or go look at the original it's all nice and lit up and his day is going to be done by candlelight isn't it it may well be all very smoky dirty difficult to, difficult to see so there may be all those factors as well as well as the artistic judgments but he does he does to make artistic judgments this is Raphael's transfiguration which is was then and is now in the Vatican Museums. But in his time, it had only been restored to the Vatican Museums relatively recently, because in the first decade of the 19th century and the previous decade of the 18th century, Napoleon, of course, was conquering all these places, grabbing all the bits of art that he could and taking them back to the Louvre. So this was taken by Napoleon, the Transfiguration, by Raphael, up to the Louvre. And Bright makes an informed comment, like all the paintings that came into the hands of the French, it has undoubtedly been much retouched. That's an interesting comment. I've never seen that said in any sort of guidebook or anything to, be, to, to this picture of Raphael's Transfiguration. It's interesting that he, as an intelligent man, thought it had been much retouched within the last decade or so when it was temporarily, as it turned out, in Paris. Before it was done. And when he's in Rome, thanks again to his journals, we know that he met, for example, this man, who is called Bertel Thorvaldsen, Thorvaldsen, who's a Danish sculptor, sculptor, who's a Danish sculptor, who lived in Rome, 1797 to 1838, you know, most of his life. And he goes, Bright goes and visits his shop. Is the word he uses, and I guess that shop really is a dual word. It means both his workshop where he's making these things and his shop where he's selling the things. So it's the two, two meanings of the word shop, both combined. And for Wilson is well known, as you can see there, for his sculptural work. These are examples from the journals. As well as the journals, as you will have seen, many hundreds of letters. And they, of course, 
relate to his daily life, mostly in London, but some are written from abroad. When you think of a collection of letters of Richard Bright, these are normally going to be letters written, written to Richard Bright, aren't they? Because obviously once he writes himself, they're going to be sent out to all his friends and relatives and scattered all across the world. So, so it's mainly the incoming letters. But in this case, there's a lot more outgoing letters than you might expect because he writes to his mother, dutiful son, he writes back to his mother in Bristol every week or whatever, I'm not sure of frequency, and he says to his mother, please keep these letters, putting them together, they form a kind of journal of my medical life. And at some stage, obviously, they do come back into the election, that's when she died or whatever. So you're getting a lot of details of his medical work. He is an intimate acquaintance of Dr. Astley Cooper, for example, as some of you will know. Uh, he was a Yarmouth born physician who was important in London. And interestingly enough, um, Bright, in one of his letters, and he's talking about Astley Cooper, not writing to him, I'm talking about him, jokes about Astley Cooper and a resurrection man. Resurrection man, body snatcher. As we, if we think back to our history, people used to go and snatch bodies and sell them to people like Ashley Cooper. And we know that Ashley Cooper did buy bodies. And this, of course, is for the purpose of, of research into the, into the anatomy of the dead. Because in this state, so in the early years of Bright's research, for example, you weren't allowed to cut up dead bodies. The only dead bodies you allowed access to were the bodies of murderers. That would be an additional sentence. You, you hang, you've murdered six children, you are sentenced to be hanged, and because your crime is so bad, your body will be taken to be anatomists to cut up. That changes during Bright's lifetime, it changes in 1832 with the Anatomy Act. The Anatomy Act says surgeons, anatomists, can have access to any body of anyone dying in a workhouse or hospital who is too poor to pay for their own funeral. So now there's thousands and thousands of bodies and no longer in demand. But Ashley Cooper is all mixed up with that. So a joking reference in one of his letters to a resurrection man may not be entirely a joking reference. Maybe but he did know that Ashley Cooper did indeed buy dead bodies for research purposes. And he talks in the other letters, uh, for example, let me give you some, he describes patients he has visited. He describes one as being his first hypochondriac. It's something he's come across for the first time, he reports out in his letters. He comes across some haymakers and they've got, they're all covered with sores from insects, I presume within the days before. Fertilizers and chemicals, when you were grabbing your hay, you were also grabbing loads of biting insects. And he recommends for that um, vinegar. Bear that in mind, insect bites, vinegar is recommended. His wife, I haven't mentioned his background, he had two wives in succession, actually. One died very young, and I don't think she'd get so much mentioned in these letters, but his second wife, Eliza, by whom he had seven children, is mentioned frequently. And she is quite often ill by the turn of these letters, but of course if you've got a doctor husband, you might like need to say, by the way, I have a sore back or whatever. And he recommends at various stages things like calomel, rhubarb, at one point, I guess you possibly suffer some nerves a bit, he recommends you give up reading novels, don't read fiction. <laughs> what you should read, he says, is Robertson's History of America. So I presume that is a book so dull it won't excite the nerves of any young lady. No, I can't say I read it. But... And it, you, I get, get the impression from the letters that he also took up a position, I imagine a charity position, with something called the Fever House, he refers to. And his mother, naturally enough, is very anxious, presumably she was in danger of, of catching fever from the in, in, inmates. So she says, please don't take up that position in the fever hospital. And later on, when he says, when he has, obviously has, he says, oh, please do give up that position in the fever hospital. Caring mother. And the charitable man, I, I, you get the impression from his letters, as you do from many a uh, surgeon physician, of course, they're earning a lot of money. 
in their professions, they also tend to do charity work as well. They will go out to things like the, the hospital or, or workhouse or something. So we're getting a, all these impressions of details which wouldn't pick up. There is a biography of him by someone called Pamela Bright, I guess a descendant. Um, but of course, she might have seen these letters, so it'd be more an extra. So if any of you are inspired, you can now go and write a new, doc, a new biography of Dr. Richard Bright with all these extra bits in it. Uh, yeah, he also takes interest in the technology of the time, which of course is important. Railways, for example. 1815, he goes and visits when it first opens the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, where he notes, to his surprise, he sees trains going as fast as 15 miles an hour. So uh, it's the beginning, in effect, of a railway age. But it's amazing how rapidly that technology develops, because by 18, that's 1815, I think, roughly, by 1839, he's advising his parents when they come up to Brist from Bristol to come up on the Brunel's super duper steam train, some the broad line, if you know your history of railways, the broad gauge line that runs from Bristol to, to London, and it's obviously state of the art. But when he gets to London, Paddington, what are the parents to do? How are they going to get about London? They to hire a chariot. I don't know what a chariot is. People who know the history of their transport may know what the, exactly he means by chariot, whether it is some earlier equivalent of. Sherlock Holmes's handsome cab. I don't know. I don't know whether it's, it's whether you're driving it yourself or whether somebody else is driving it uh, in a taxi, for example. And he, he's always interested in sort of technology and transport. He describes things he's seen, I'm sure, over in London or elsewhere, which he calls mechanical substitutes for donkeys. These are, I think, an early form of bicycle. I think that's what he's referring to. Mm -hmm. They're obviously to be ridden on because he says, as yet, they have not been constructed for ladies. Which almost makes me think, as a total aside, uh, of a Stephen Fry thing on QI when he was talking to Carrie Ed Lloyd about how, in these early Victorian times, doctors, not Fry himself, but other doctors, definitely recommended ladies shouldn't ride bicycles. It would get them excited and it would give them a bicycle face to interfere with their chances of matrimony. That is not that is not Richard Bright, I used to know, but that is, that is a, what is said by doctors at the time. So there Richard Bright has taken interest in these mechanical donkeys for people to ride on, for men at least to ride on. And he's also taken some interest in art. For example, he goes to an exhibition of the work of Benjamin Haydn. Benjamin Haydn, that artist I quite like, but most people have totally forgotten. He was all the rage in, say, the 1820s, 1830s. So it goes to, so for Bright to say he's gone to an exhibition by Benjamin Haydn would be equivalent to say you've got an exhibition by David Hockney or something like that. So he's showing he was in, in the swing of what was going on in the world. Haydn tends to paint extremely melodramatic pictures, pictures, paintings, or action paintings, historic scenes. There's one in Exeter, which is where I come from, and where Haydn came from, indeed, of his horse jumping into his chasm, which my sister said was the worst painting ever on public display. If you know about horses, it's all totally wrong. But that wouldn't have bothered Haydn. He also did, of course, for money, more ordinary paintings like this. This is the Duke of Wellington. And this would have been on display at that exhibition that Bright went to. Bright actually had several links to the Duke of Wellington. I told you he was in Hungary in 1814. When Bright was coming back from Hungary, 1814, coming into 1815 now, um, he received news. How did he receive it? Interesting question. It's on you to speculate. But the Battle of Waterloo is in the process of taking place, or has just taken place. And he diverts himself to Belgium as a good doctor and does what he can amongst the wounded lying out in the fields or the hospitals as a result of the Battle of Waterloo. So there's one link between Haydn and Wellington. Another link is a, no, between Brighton and Wellington. Another link is Brighton, Bright mentions seeing Wellington ride about in Hyde Park, as you would, not uncommon, Wellington lived near Hyde Park, didn't he? And as I say, also the link with Haydn. 
it's some of the things that Bright doesn't seem to mention are politics. He doesn't have any involvement in politics, doesn't seem particularly interested. And he doesn't, as far as I can recall, ever mention any religion apart from things like visiting churches in Rome. He doesn't mention any personal religious beliefs, which is quite interesting because he's talking at a time, isn't he, when some people are not happy with the discoveries being made by geologists in particular, which might appear to some people's eyes to not be in accord with the Bible, with the Old Testament. It is to be interpreted literally. So there are controversies, controversies like that, which he doesn't seem to mention. As I say, he's a regular member of the Royal Society, who have that motto I gave you about finding things out for yourself. And during the time he was there, you're getting people like Fox Talbot introducing the early beginnings of photography. The development of photography is just coming in. And you're also getting Babbage, Charles Babbage, discussing his inventions of calculators and things, which people say lead on and on and on eventually to the computer. And so those are the kind of people he's mixing with, and these are the kind of items you're getting in these letters. And as you he said, we don't, there's many more letters to come. So if you are going to write a biography of Bright, this is one, another picture of him, hold your fire until the Yuki has done the rest of the collection. I get the impression, uh, I may be wrong, but that's first box we had so far seems to cover period 1820s, 1830s, and therefore the second box probably covers the later, the later part of his life. And so uh, just to finish off with, with this here, another picture of him. I can remember when those boxes came in all those years ago, uh, just a little, little more piles of dust and some people might have queried, if I can remember, at least two people did query, what on earth are you keeping that rubbish for? Surely you could that straight on the bin. But they, obviously the Norfolk Record Office takes a long-term view. To, uh, if we can serve those now, at least if we keep them now, keep them in the right conditions now, time will come when technology changes, technology improves, and we are able to go into those apparent piles of dust and actually restore at least some of them and get all this kind of information. So really, as we're here on Heritage Open Days, we're celebrating technology and triumphs of technology and centuries celebrating that twice over. We've got Richard Bright and all of his various discoveries in the fields of medicine, geology, linguistics and all that. And then we've got the work of Yuki in turning those piles of dust into inf informative and useful historical documents describing the life of a fascinating man of two centuries ago.